All right, over to you. Thank you. Great to be here today. So it wouldn't be a presentation by me if I didn't have PowerPoints. So PowerPoints. Some say death by PowerPoints, but I hope that I hope it's life by PowerPoints. So today is Earth Day. April 22nd is the day that Earth Day is celebrated. This year is the 51st anniversary. The theme this year is Restore Our Earth. Last year's theme, which I had put a to talk together but never got to give it, was um, climate action. And of course, dealing with uh, climate change. And I'm going to hide the floating thing here. So this was last year's pretty picture. I liked it, so I kept it. So 51 years. And so it's observed annually. It was founded by a US Senator, uh, Gaylord Nelson, as an environmental teach-in. And it was first celebrated in 1970. He was later awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom uh, in recognition for his work. And basically it's a call for action to protect our planet, to demonstrate and promote environmental awareness. It's celebrated in almost 200 countries officially. Um, <clears throat> And there is an Earth Day network which coordinates events globally. So if you wanted to participate, <clears throat> excuse me, you can participate um, and look up the network and find out all different ways that you can participate. So again, um, it's a, uh, as a result of Earth Day, the Clean Air Act was passed in the US in 1970, a safe, Drinking Water Act was passed four years later. The EPA is the Environmental Protection um, Agency. The federal agency is dedicated to keeping pollution and waste in check, so that was formed. <clears throat> and what was interesting this year, well, was that the COVID pandemic created less travel, fewer planes, fewer cars, ultimately less pollution, cleaner air, and we got wildlife where we would not have normally seen wildlife. We got a lot of interesting impacts, positive impacts from the COVID pandemic. Most of us think of uh, the COVID pandemic as being something very restrictive for forcing us to be quarantined and everything. I have some slides showing some of the um, effects of the, um, the positive effects of the uh, pandemic. I love this particular icon, make every day Earth Day. We don't want just to celebrate it one day a year, but every day. Um, again, some of the things that were passed, um, there was also an Endangered Species Act um, and other environmental laws that were passed as well. Uh, there's a website you can check out, www.earthday.org. And it was formed in 1990. Uh, the day that Earth Day went global. So if you want to find out about more stuff, check out that uh, website. I'm not going to repeat a lot of that stuff, but I will some. So today, instead of talking about all the things that you can do to better the Earth, I'm going to talk about our connection to the Earth and our connection and our our similarity to many of the creatures, plant and animal that are on earth. And I think that if we, if we grow to understand something, we grow to appreciate it and protect it. If we're just told, hey, you got to do this, you know, you kind of say, okay, I'll try to do it. But when you start loving these creatures, loving the rest of life on earth, I think that you'll automatically start doing things to protect the earth and make it a better place to live. So I'm gonna look at Earth Day itself, which we did a little bit already. I'm gonna also look at what some corporations are doing because I think it's fascinating how much corporations are doing. Earth Day is now a, it has political force and companies will uh, show their 
cooperation with Earth Day objectives. So I think uh, one of the things that we're gonna look at is the appreciation of plants and animals and recognizing the unity of life. It's probably a different Earth Day talk than you're used to, but it also has the um, ability to, um, I think, create an appreciation of our Earth that will then create uh, a positive show of, of action. So the 2021 theme, Restore Our Earth, uh, these are the bullet points, <clears throat> building on the growth and resilience of the environmental movement worldwide. The theme is based on the emerging concept that rejects the idea that our only options to save the earth are to mitigate or adapt. Um, scientists, other non-government um, organizations, businesses, and government worldwide are looking at natural systems and emerging green technologies to look at restoring earth's ecosystems and forests. And I think it's kind of amazing because the pandemic by all by itself did a lot to restore some of the ecosystems. And of course, the big problem, of course, rid the oceans of plastic. Um, EarthDay.org, www.earthday.org has these five actions for this year, climate action, science and education, people and communities, conservation and restoration, and plastics. So you can check that out, find out what you can do, find out who's doing what, find out, learn more. So what do we celebrate? Earth is more than a physical planet. It has life from rocks to plants to animals to humans, et cetera. That's on the physical plane. It also includes emotions, spiritual states, mental states. So it's more, Earth is more than just the rest mass matter. It's also the, um, the non-material states. Instead of trying to point out theosophical principles throughout, I'm going to say that throughout this talk, I'm going to be trying to show you that all life is intelligent, that all is alive, at least the, the plants and animals have a life, not just, just growing there, but they're alive, that memory is more than brains, that the universe somehow remembers there's some sort of Akashic record or something that these um, plants and animals can tap into for memory. There's of course the as above, so below, and we're going to see that as we see in animals and, and uh, humans, so we can also see in plants. Compassion, empathy, and altruism show up in a lot of studies, recent, recent studies. So I've brought in some of those studies as well. And of course, life is more than physical, it's emotional, mental, spiritual. So I won't be trying to make these connections, but I think you'll see them as I go through the talk. So this was something from uh, one of the New York uh, state um, agencies. They did this study and they found that spending time in forests actually makes us healthier. I know that when you walk through a forest, you feel good, but they actually studied it. So <clears throat> the, um, the Department of Environmental, oh dear, uh, it's not cooperation, I'll remember it eventually. But the DEC um, for New York State found that exposures to trees and forests, trees emit an invisible chemical called um, phyto phytocides that reduce stress hormones uh, in our bodies, such as cortisol, lowers blood pressure and, imp and improves immunity. These phytocides have antibacterial and antifungal qualities which help plants fight disease. But when we're walking through the forest, we inhale um, and our bodies respond by increasing the number and activities of a type of white blood cell called NKs, natural killer cells. I know it's kind of tough, that word, but these NKs kill tumors and virus infected cells in our bodies. So just by walking through a forest, you're enhancing your uh, NK white blood cells. And the study showed that increased NK activity from a three-day, two-night forest trip 
lasted for more than 30 days. In other words, exposure and being in a forest and trees will boost the immune system, lower blood pressure, reduce stress, improve mood, increase the ability to focus even when children have ADHD, faster recovery from surgery or illness, increases energy and improves sleep. And I could certainly do a lot of that last one. So one of the unfortunate things we don't have in the city, these wonderful forests, but we do have some wonderful trees. We do have Central Park, which has a lot of trees. So the DEC examined a situation where trees were lost. So what happens when we lose trees? There's this um, organism called the EAB, the Emerald Ash Borer. And it has this unfortunate um, characteristic of killing ash trees. Basically, it's a non-native wood boring beetle that kills all species of ash trees within three years of infestation. Some communities had entire streets lined with ash trees and every ash tree was killed after the beetle arrived. <clears throat> so this, since 2002, this, and this is the scientific name um, of the ash borer, has provided an unfortunate opportunity to look at the effects of tree loss on human health. So they looked at heart and lung related deaths in areas of EAB infestation. Across 15 states, EAB was associated with an additional 6,000 plus deaths related to lung disease and 15,000 plus deaths related to heart related disease. So even trees in cities and communities will give us longer life. The largest tree is called General Sherman. It's in California. It's a redwood. And as you see here, there's people down there. This is not Photoshop. This tree is huge. We have seen it. We've been there. Um, they don't let you walk all the way up to the tree. Um, Dora Kunst, who we um, Ed gave a presentation on um, not too long ago, uh, once said that the angel of the United States had a long range view of the destiny of the country. She said the angel was like the great sequoia trees, stable and peaceful. And somehow even just looking at these beautiful, stately, massive, long lived trees, you get a sense of peace. So that's the uh, Redwood, California. <clears throat> um, one of the wonderful things about trees is that they have this ability for renewal. And Linda Oliveira said at the International Convention just recently, she said many trees have sub bark buds or thick barks or trees, seeds that regrow after a forest fire. She described the eucalyptus trees in Aust um, Australia that had buds that come out after a fire. So fire is often a regenerative and renewal process in nature. It is not just a destructive process, but it offers this opportunity for renewal. And I think that often a change gives us that power for renewal. <clears throat> I'm gonna look at plants. <clears throat> I found a lot of this stuff fascinating. I have a website down here if you want to check out and read more about what I'm talking about. <clears throat> but apparently plants have some way of remembering things. Plants have this amazing memory that um, has been shown um, in a number of scientific studies. We also have, of course, the sociability of trees and the cognitive capabilities of our vegetable cousins all around us as well. So the mimosa um, is called the touch me not. Uh, the leaves here, you can see the leaves better here, the mimosa. <clears throat> when you touch it, the leaves set tight. And it's sometimes called the touch me not because of the way the leaves snap shut defensively in response to a threat. So what they did for this poor, this poor little plant is they would drop it from a height 
And when they did, the plant detected a threat, and so it closed its, closed its leaves. But eventually, they would drop it several times, and eventually the plant learned that this was harmless. It really had no reason to be defensive, and it stopped folding. It stopped closing its leaves in response to being dropped. It learned. So somehow this plant learned. Also, the interesting thing about these plants, they know that opening their leaves is the only way they can uh, do photosynthesis. And so in bright sun, if they're touched, they snap shut immediately. If the sun is dim, they have to sort of weigh the the benefits of closing and getting away from the threat and losing the, the photosynthesis or staying open and having photosynthesis. So in dim light, they don't shut as fast. And it seems that they know that they don't want to lose the benefits of the dim sun. I just found that fascinating. I mean, we don't know what a plant's really thinking. We can only say that this is a response that it has a measured response. Um, the mallow. The mallow is an interesting plant because it seems to remember where the sun comes up. So its leaves will turn in the direction before sunrise, it will turn its leaves in the direction of where the sun came up on the previous day. It remembered where the sun came up. And then during the day, its leaves follow. And at the end of the day, its leaves are all in the other direction. But overnight, it moves its leaves back. <clears throat> and when it, when it moves its leaves back, it does it before sunrise. So you may think, well, maybe it's recognizing the um, the gravitational pull of the sun. But what they did was in the lab, they created an artificial sun and they moved that artificial sun across. And then at night, they moved the light back to the other side where it had come up the day before. And lo and behold, all the mallow leaves moved in the direction of where it anticipated this, this imitation sun would come up. So, they tried to confuse the mallows in their labs by swapping the location of the light source, but the plants simply learned the new orientation. We have memory in plants without a brain. How did they know? How did they remember? Can't necessarily answer that, but I think theosophically we can say that everything is remembered in the universe. So again, here's another picture of these um, little mallow plants, and it learned the new location when the, when the scientist tried to mess with his head, <laughs> I put that in quotes, by changing the light's direction. Here's another one. The jewelweed. It's a small plant, but it will recognize if the nearby plants are kin or not kin. If the plants are kin, then they don't want to block the sunlight to their fellow plants. But if the plants are not kin, then they don't care about protecting their, those other plants. So when the nearby plants are kin related, that is there are other jewel plants, jewel weeds, it grows roots, but not necessarily a lot of leaves. But when the plants nearby are not kin, they are unrelated, it grows leaves and that effectively blocks the sunlight to its strangers. I found that to be um, interesting. Like we've all heard of uh, mother trees in the forest that protect the trees around. I didn't put a slide in on that, but I'm sure you've heard about those. Um, and that's another very fascinating thing. And also when we were in the redwoods, the uh, forest ranger showed us a tree that was just a stump. It went up maybe 50, 60 feet, but it had no leaves. But the stump was alive because the redwood trees around it were giving nourishment through the root system to this stump. And so this stump had been alive for a number of years with no leaves. It, 
it top had been knocked off in a lightning storm. It had been struck by lightning, so it knocked the top of the tree off. But its fellow trees around it were all keeping it alive. So here's a um, another. It's sometimes called the mouse ear cress. Um, it can detect the vibrations of caterpillars munching on it. And as soon as it does, it releases oils and chemicals that repel those, um, those uh, Caterpillar. caterpillars. So it, it says, oh, I've got this vibration. I need to release. I mean, how does it know this? It learns this. It doesn't release those chemicals and oils when there aren't caterpillars. And then this is again, uh, symbiosis is very common throughout the entire uh, universe. I mean, we have, <clears throat> we have symbiotic relationships with the bacteria in our gut. We, we wouldn't really be alive without that bacteria in our gut. It keeps us, it keeps us going. It um, gives us B vitamins, etc. And so that's a classic symbiotic relationship. Another classic symbiotic relationship is lichens, which is a combination of fungi and algae. And the algae providing photosynthesis and food to the fungi, and the fungi providing uh, water and, uh, that, and stability to the algae. But this is another example of a symbiotic relationship. These white fuzzy things are not roots. That is my mycorrhizal fungi. And it's a white fungal network called hyphae, those are not plant roots. And that's the principal structure for the uptake of many important nutrients in the plant kingdom. In other words, a lot of plants really cannot survive without working with fungi. So we've got two totally separate kingdoms involved in uh, supporting each other. They, <laughs> the author got a little bit um, carried away and they said plants communicate with one another and other organisms, parasites, microbes, using channels such as these mycorrhizal networks as a kind of subterranean internet. I love that. So these, uh, these fungi provide the below the ground subterranean internet of communication. The garden pea, you've all had peas. This is, this is how they grow. Um, the scientists wanted to know whether the plants would learn that a blast of air meant that that was where the sun was coming from. Um, and would they remember a blast of air? <clears throat> so they, they placed seedlings at the base of a Y maze. And they had air and sun coming on only one of the forks of the Y maze. Then they allowed the plants to grow into either fork to see if they had learned an association. And yes, they did. They learned that the, buffered, the buffeting by air meant that that was going to be a brighter um, and more productive uh, growth. So even, even plants, like garden peas can learn. So I found this was interesting. Look at this image. What do you see? I'll give you a couple seconds. What comes out to you? What do you see first? Most people would say that they see these two animals either playing or jumping on each other or fighting or something. They may even name the species of dinosaur or lizard. But how many of you said, oh, there are evergreens in the background. There's grass here. There's, gr there's growing grass here. There's uh, bushes over here. How many of you noticed all of the green growth around? We tend to think of plants as being background. We don't necessarily appreciate how how wise they are, how much they learn, how much they know, how much they, they can apply this knowledge. So eventually we're gonna be getting into the minds of protozoa and that'll be the next stage for our scientists to start studying. So 
It wouldn't be me without some comic strips. So Earth Day, mom, you're tracking dirt and mud everywhere. Kids, think of it as us celebrating Earth Day. So today you can walk in with muddy shoes and celebrate Earth Day. Um, <clears throat> another one, Hobbes is um, this stuffed tiger, which comes to life when Calvin is alone with his stuffed toy. This is Calvin, the little boy. I was reading about how countless species are being pushed towards extinction by man's destruction of forests. Sometimes I think the surest sign that intelligent life exists elsewhere in the universe is that none of it has tried to contact us. So back to trees. They was discovering that trees have a certain heartbeat. It can't really be a heartbeat because it doesn't have a heart like we have in, um, in, mam in uh, many animals, but it does have a certain pulse. And that pulse actually helps push the water up into, from the ground up into the leaves. It used to be thought that osmosis was the thing that pulled the water up, but now they're seeing that there's a certain pulsing. That pulsing is a very slow pulsing, sometimes less than once an hour, but it actually in, is involved with pushing the water up into the uh, three branches from the ground. So the study, uh, was headed by these people from Hungary and Denmark. Uh, they used a um, monitoring device known as a terrestrial scanning, uh, sorry, terrestrial laser scanning to survey the movement of 22 different kinds of trees. And they revealed that at night, the trees re routinely have beats that pulsate throughout their entire body. And these distribute water throughout the tree, similarly to the way a heart pumping blood <clears throat> distributes blood throughout um, an animal or human body. So again, they occur very slowly. And the osmosis, it was, is not the only way that water is distributed throughout the trees. In fact, it may not even be the way particularly, but it is one of the ways. As we know, trees have circadian rhythms. Trees move a lot more than people thought. A number of species of trees drop their leaves after the sun goes down. We could say they're sleeping, in quotes. Um, and they raise their leaves earlier. Uh, way back when, the first circadian, circadian means that there's a rhythm that follows the sun. So it's a 24 hour rhythm. And interestingly enough, many plants will follow that rhythm even in a steady, unchanging laboratory light. So if you bring the plants into a lab and they do not see the sun, but they have a light, uh, not too bright, not too dim, but enough to live on, and that continuous without changing, the, the plants still maintain their circadian rhythm of going through photosynthesis during the day, uh, carbon dioxide processing at night, the, um, the leaves will raise and lower I have a, a prayer plant um, back there and the leaves come way up in the daytime and at night, those leaves go down totally flat. They are totally vertical at night. So there's a huge circadian rhythm from sun plants. And it's again, they keep this circadian rhythm whether or not the sun is there, which I find fascinating. So insects, insects are the, probably one of the most important things that we have on this earth. Insects keep our world going. <clears throat> Many people hate bugs, even though they pollinate the world's foods and they're critical in the food chain and they get rid of waste. So they're the bottom of the food chain. They get eaten by bigger organisms, which get eaten by bigger organisms and and they're also critical for getting rid of waste. So in the last 30 years, the world spent billions of dollars on new ways to kill insects and mere pennies on how to preserve them. Of course, honeybees and monarchs are the biggest in the news and they best illustrate insect decline. But we probably lose about one to 2% of our insects every year. And 
That's important. So back to insects. In the store, salespeople trying to sell a dress to a client. It will help if you stop saying our dresses are made of bug poop. Most of our customers prefer to call it silk. So next time you buy a silk blouse or a silk dress or silk something, just remember it's bug poop. No? Okay. Um, a lot of whales will change their tunes when ships appear. <clears throat> um, the humpback whales, they will use sound to find food and to find mates and also to navigate. Now, commercial ships emit low frequency noise whenever they roam and this unwanted soundtrack negatively affects marine life. There's been a lot on the news recently, um, recently, I mean, the last few years about the negative effect of uh, large ships on uh, whales and other marine life. <clears throat> but the humpback whale will stop singing or shorten its songs when ships are passing. And they won't start up their song maybe until 30 minutes later after the ship has got past. And these low frequency noise levels have been increasing significantly over the last few decades. So it has negatively impacted the, um, especially the humpback whales. So they, early 2017, they started setting up um, underwater recorders um, off the coast of a Japanese island. And they listened to the recording and they were able to identify one to three singers, male humpback singers, and 26 singers in all. The male humpback sings to attract mates. If it's not singing, it's not attracting a mate. They found that the singing behavior changed in the presence of ships. This 40 ton mammal was either stopped singing or shortened its song when a ship approached or until it had passed. A range of up to nearly three quarters of a mile, 1,200 meters or 1,000, 1.2 kilometers, kilometers um, uh, away and the ships would reduce or terminate their songs. For some reason or other, if the whale was swimming under the ship, it continued to sing. And again, it did not restart singing for about 30 minutes. So we found that whales respond to ocean noise. And this was another study of stress in whales. So they have these dogs that could smell whale feces in the water. And because of that, that allowed the scientists to collect samples. <clears throat> so right after the 9-11 uh, terrorist attacks, uh, 11 September terrorist attacks, they did the study of these whales off the Bay of Fundy in Canada. They found that with the reduced shipping traffic following the terrorist attack, it resulted in a 6 dB decrease in low frequency underwater noise. In other words, it was a lot quieter underwater because there was a lot less, lot fewer ships. Everything kind of came to a halt at that time. They also found a huge drop in the level of stress hormones in the right whale's feces. The following year, when commercial shipping returned, the stress hormone levels in the whale feces returned to the normal really high levels. So it's clear that the whales are being stressed by the commercial shipping and they were actually quite peaceful um, in the quiet after 9-11. It's interesting that something so horrible had a positive effect on nature. So sound is critical to the humpbacks. They rely on sound to find food, to find mates, to look to find their way around. So as a general rule in ecology, when you make a wild animal change its behavior, there are almost always negative effects. And these calls from the humpback travel thousands of miles so they can communicate with mammals on quite a wide range. And fire, by the way, is not burning something. That's uh, Dr. Fire, the scientist that was doing that. <clears throat> beaked whales, this is a picture of a beaked whale, sort of a beaky mm -hmm. sort of 
So they found some deadly impacts um, on beak whales during the Navy, US Navy training exercises. These are a separate deeper diving species. And these, the giant noises that the Navy sonar ships made um, would cause, sometimes would cause these deep diving whales to freak out, to use a technical term, and they would bolt straight for the surface, something they would never normally do. And if they're deep and they bolt for the surface, they die. This is a version of the bends, the decompression sickness that scuba divers get if they rise too quickly. So these noise doesn't just disrupt these whales, the beaked whales, it actually has the potential to kill them because of the stress and the resulting action. Even bacteria communicate, somehow or other bacteria communicate electronically through our bodies. So this is a picture of some bacteria and they got together and you can see they formed this wonderful um, uh, design. So these bacteria are actually talking to each other. If you can use the word talk in quotes, they're communicating somehow. And they did find that there was an electro, a low electrostatic um, measurable communication. This is a picture of a biofilm. We're all familiar with biofilms. Biofilms, the most common one is the plaque that we get on our teeth. Now, apparently the, bi the bacteria in a biofilm can actually communicate and call other bacteria in our body to, hey, come and join me. We got good stuff going here. So they send some sort of a, 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 an evite to come and join and strengthen the community. So once a little bit of plaque gets going, hey, they all start coming. So they can communicate and call other bacteria to the site where, they're, where there's good stuff happening, in their opinion. <clears throat> Flowers. Flowers can hear buzzing bees. Now, I use the word hear in very loosely because they don't have ears, but they are aware of buzzing bees. And the interesting thing is that when they hear a buzzing bee, they make their nectar sweeter. The response is that the flower increases the sugar content in its nectar because it knows that that was what the bees like. So it suggests that in at least one case, the plants can hear or be aware of buzzing and that it confers an evolutionary advantage because the bee comes and gets its nectar, but it also transfers pollen and that pollen helps fertilize other plants so that it will continue um, living as a, as a species. So the, so the evening primrose, within minutes of sensing vibrations from a pollinator's wing, the plants temporarily increase the concentration of sugar in their flowers nectar. It, it takes them like three minutes or less to say, hey, let's pump more sugar out. <clears throat> so within three minutes, this is by the way, the um, evening primrose flowers, and you can see the pollen on the, uh, on the stamens. The sugar concentration in the plants increased 12 to 17 and sometimes up to 20%. Within three minutes, suddenly it said, hey, here's more sugar, bees, come and get it. Now the bowl shape of the flowers uh, may be the key to their acoustic capability because it kind of, just like our ears are set up to kind of um, collect sound. So these bowl shapes are able to collect the sound um, of the bee. <clears throat> the interesting thing is that if you removed one or two petals, then those flowers did not increase their sugar concentration because apparently by removing a petal, you remove its ability to hear, that is to collect the sound. So the flower, that particular flower was unaware of the bee around it. So it has to be a complete flower. Don't, don't pick some of the petals, it messes it up. Mm. So most flowers are in some way concave or bowl shaped, which is perfect for receiving and amplifying sound waves, very much like a satellite dish. So here we have um, a hoverfly resting on a, um, 
a dew uh, of evening evening primrose and that's dew on it. So what else do plants hear? So there's many questions that scientists have, more questions and answers about this ability of plants to respond to sound. Like are some ears better than others? And why does the evening primrose make its nectar so much more sweet when the bees are able to detect changes in sugar concentration as small as one to 3%? Evening prim primrose is throwing out 12 to 20% when all it really needed to do was throw out one to 3%. So it may be some sort of a competitive advantage by being sweeter and competing with each other. We don't know. So Veltz, the scientist here said, I'd like people to understand that hearing is not only for ears. Plants hear, animals hear, of course, and we hear. Except for my husband who needs hearing aids. <laughs> I'm teasing him. <laughs> There was a whole bunch of studies of altruism in plants. They called it empathy. So they showed that parrots, um, these African gray parrots have empathy. They found that a parrot who had less would give to, sorry, a parrot who had more would give to a parrot who had less, whether or not they were related. It wasn't a mother child, which you would understand that relationship. It was two um, unrelated gray parrots. They happen to be some of the most socially complex birds. And they are popular pets because they can talk. So what they did was they had two parrots on, in two separate cages with a hole where they could kind of pass things back and forth. And they trained the, parrot, the parrots to exchange tokens for food. So they would, you see these things on the floor here. Those are tokens. So if the parrot gave the handler, the scientist, a token, the scientist would give them food. Now, if the parrot on the one side had lots of tokens and noticed that the parrot on the other side did not have tokens and that that parrot was hungry, those two things had to be both together, then the parrot with the tokens would give the tokens to the parrot who had none, and then that parrot could um, exchange those tokens for food. So the parrot understood that tokens represented food. They could give the token to the other parrot, and then that parrot could get food because it had tokens. Among other things, it shows the brilliance of these birds, but it also shows that they cared about each other. If the first parrot um, had tokens and the other parrot was not hungry, the first parrot did not give them tokens, only when it, when it needed um, some food or wanted food. A lot of studies have been shown with bats and rats and chimps <clears throat> um, and other species that have demonstrated selflessness. There's a lot of growing evidence of selflessness across the animal kingdom. It is not unique to humans. I mean, most people, if you see somebody fall, will go and help them up, will pick them up. If you see someone struggling with a door, you run over and help them. Of course, with these quarantine days, you sometimes say, oh, stay away from me, I don't want to get sick. But um, there is this innate desire to help someone um, who needs help. Um, another uh, species of great ape, uh, the bonobos, they will freely donate their food to a stranger. <clears throat> Even when that stranger gives them uh, no, no reward. <clears throat> the bonobos would help get food to other bonobos even when that help that was provided had no reward to the original bonobo. They helped each other even when a total stranger. Uh, so we have this innate compassion throughout the um, animal kingdom and even compassion that we saw in the plant kingdom. 
vampire bats. Don't let their razor sharp fangs fool you. They have a soft side. This is a vampire bat. <clears throat> they will regurgitate some of their blood meal to other bats that are desperate for need, whether or not they are family. <clears throat> whether or not a bat had received a previous donation is much more important than relatedness for predicting if that animal will share food. So if it sees that another bat needs food, it will donate it frequently. <clears throat> Norway rats, you know, these fuzzy little creatures here. They not only help their fellow rats, but they also remember who helped them. So bananas, yeah, bananas. <laughs> Researchers trained rats to donate either a high quality treat, which is a banana, or a low quality treat, a carrot, to another rat. So the rat would give a treat to another rat. Now, then they provided the recipient rat, the receiver rat, to return the favor. And the recipient rat would give cereal back to the um, original rats. The rats that gave them bananas were more likely to get their cereal, to get a cereal uh, gift back. So in other words, these rats remembered who gave them the better treats and they would give cereal more likely to the rat that gave them the better treat. They remembered who gave them the better treat. They put two and two together, so to speak. I'm gonna skip this. I think we're running out of time. Um, yeah. About 14 minutes. So rats helping rats. You dirty rat is a slur because rats actually um, avoid um, hurting each other. And they showed a lot of empathy across the rats. This was published in the National Geographic. Um, rats and humans share the same part of a brain that regulates harm aversion. It's the anterior cingulate cortex. And this has shown that the much aligned rodents actually assist their companions in need, as well as remembering individual rats that help them specifically. By the way, one of the things that I don't have in this talk, but I'll just mention briefly, crows, which we know are one of the brightest um, birds out there. If a person torments a crow, and that crow then has, has uh, lays eggs and raises other little baby crows, the mother crow will teach the baby crows to avoid that person that was tormenting them. Even though that person, even though the baby birds never saw that person and that person never came around after the eggs were hatched. The mother was able to teach them somehow what that awful person was like and then later on, if that person came by and just the babies were there, they knew that that was the person that they should avoid, that that was the person that tormented their mother. So they're able to teach their kids and it's actually involved facial recognition because if that person came wearing a mask over their face, it didn't have a reaction from the crows, only when they could see the original face. I don't have that in this talk, but I have it somewhere along the line. <clears throat> um, they had this uh, thing where when rats heard their fellow rats squeaking and they realized that it had something to do with levers that they were pushing, the original rats would stop pushing the lever and switch to um, a less preferred lever um, so that their fellow rats in a separate cage would not be shocked. So they were able to recognize that their action was causing somehow pain to a fellow rat. I have a bunch of just sweet little pictures. This is a hen taking care of two kittens during a storm. This is a goose taking care of a little puppy, keeping it warm um, under her wing. And I've got several pictures of those. These are three um, unusual friends, a lion, a tiger, and a bear. 
Uh, they were rescued as cubs. They became best friends for life. And it was thought that as cubs, maybe they'll get along, but when they grew up, they still, excuse me, they still got along. And it was clear that they bonded for life and they bonded um, all the way to the ends of their life. They remained um, best friends, lifelong friends, best friends forever. This is playing. So we have best friends forever. This is another case of <clears throat> gorillas um, noticed that poachers had put out traps uh, to catch um, <clears throat> deer and stuff like that. And the gorillas watched a, <clears throat> a tracker from um, the uh, Mountain Gorilla Veterinary Project, they noticed a, tr um, a tracker, how the tracker dismantled the trap, the poacher's trap. And so they started dismantling. So this is 2012, uh, Volcanoes National Park in Rwanda. Four-year-old mountain gorillas, Rima and Decore, male and female respectively. Uh, they were caught on camera dismantling traps set by poachers they realized that those traps hurt other animals and they were dismantling them. <clears throat> and one of the trackers uh, saw a snare um, near the gorilla clan. And when he tried to deactivate it, that is take the snare apart, he was stopped by the silverback gorilla who then <clears throat> jumped on the bent tree lamp branch and freed the noose. In other words, dismantling the trap. <clears throat> They saw another snare and they went closer and a third gorilla came out and helped them dismantle it. <clears throat> so here's a picture of that snare right there. You can probably barely see it. Um, the conservationists couldn't find the snares very easily but the gorillas sometimes got caught in them. And so um, they were dismantling them. They figured out how to, to dismantle them. Again, those snares were set for poachers who wanted antelopes and other uh, bushmeat. So here's a question for you. 2019 was the second hottest year worldwide in recorded history. What was the hottest year? You can sing the um, dum bum 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 bum. Okay, you have your answers. The hottest year on record was 2020, which tied with 2016. So up until last year, 16, 2016 was the hottest year on record. 2020 tied it. So I mentioned that the 9-11 uh, reduction in traffic, air traffic shut down around the world, um, shipping shut down had benefits to animals. The COVID-19 quarantine effect has also had a number of very positive effects on our earth, not perhaps on humans, but on the rest of the <laughs> rest of our earth. So there's a, there's a documentary, which I have not watched, but I would like to, <clears throat> When the World Shut Down, uh, it's narrated by David Attenborough. And there's a trailer that's on YouTube which I put down here, um, which you can watch. And I did, and I pulled some stuff out from the trailer. Fascinating, some, some fascinating stuff. <clears throat> so for example, because of less traffic, fewer planes, fewer cars, just less traffic altogether, more bicycle riding, et cetera, the Himalayan mountains for the first time can be seen from 30 miles away. So here's a picture of the Himalayas from 30 miles away. This is the first time in 40 years, apparently, that they could be seen. Uh, beaches in South Africa have been closed. And as a result, a near extinct penguin can come back twice a day to feed its young on the beach. Otherwise, they were people and it would not come back and feed its young and causing this poor penguin to nearly go extinct. The beaches have far less traffic on them. So animals, plants, 
and uh, shellfish, et cetera, uh, that um, live on the beach or near the beach or use the beach are becoming uh, more populated. Here's baby turtles. With beaches closed, these baby turtles have a much better chance of surviving. The, um, the pandemic shutdown in San Francisco allowed uh, these, these little sparrows, um, the white crowed sparrows to survive. Basically, because there is less urban noise, um, the birds um, can sing their lower, softer, he called it sexier melodies. With all of the urban noise in San Francisco, that's a city in California, um, a fairly well populated city. With all of the noise, the birds had adapted to singing above the urban noise. They had to sing louder and higher, you know, higher. Lower sounds don't carry as well as higher sounds. If you're a musician, you know that the high sounds, the high soprano sounds, the high instruments of your, of your band, they carry. The low sounds kind of fill in, but they don't, they have to be much louder in order to carry, and that's a lot more effort. So because of the reduced noise pollution, so we think of pollution as being plastic bottles and chemicals, but noise pollution is another huge one. Light pollution is another huge one. So these, use their um, these sparrows use their tunes to lure mates and to defend their territory, which can of course make or break the individual survival. The wider the bandwidth basically, the sexier they are, the more likely they are to mate. So even in the cities, we have this benefit. I've got a whole bunch of stuff on chemical, on, uh, on, on companies that have, uh, that are trying to, um, to help the environment. Of course, we all know that companies' main, main purpose is to make a profit, but if they know that they're helping the environment, they're more likely to make a profit. So we sort of support them. So Ikea as a huge um, shipping um, place is replacing styrofoam package with compostable mushroom foam, which will deteriorate in your garden in two to three weeks, unlike the plastic styrofoam, which never ever deteriorates. So um, that's a whole bunch of things on this called microfoam. And it's made of waste products such as corn or hemp or oat hulls or cotton burrs or mushroom spores. Uh, Minnesota, which is one of the states in central and north central United States, is paying homeowners to replace their lawns with bee friendly wildflowers. So here's a bee friendly lawn. You get paid for having um, no grass. You get paid for having a bee friendly lawn. In Newark, New Jersey, that's a state on the Northeast of United States. They have um, some of the world's biggest indoor vertical farms. They're using recycled plastic bottles instead of soil as their substrate. So they're using these plastic bottles that otherwise would not um, uh, get recycled perhaps. And they are able to raise vegetables sustainably year around. The National Geographic, um, has had a, you know, a whole thing on protecting our species. So they've been, they've joined with about um, a large, other large conservation organizations uh, calling for about 30% of the earth to be protected in some way by 2030. That's only nine years from now. Google celebrates Earth Day Every year they have these wonderful things on Earth Day. It's, it's their fun. Microsoft supports Earth Day. So Microsoft has this year five topics that they focus on. The canopy, which is our, our restoring our forests and trees. Um, a footprint for the future in terms of fighting climate. A great, a great global cleanup for like getting rid of plastics. Um, a climate and environmental literacy, where they work with grassroots communities to um, enable uh, national initiatives, et cetera. And a huge database that they're putting together so that people can see what's going on and figure out ways that they can help. 
Um, I'm going to skip these slides, which are all um, Microsoft focusing on different things last year. And this year, carbon negative, water positive, uh, zero waste, ecosystems. Oh, and toilet paper. A whole bunch of companies are now working on making toilet paper out of bamboo. Bamboo has short fibers. It grows within a few months. Trees take years, you know, 20 years or more before you can really get a decent tree out of it. And these companies are making bamboo toilet paper, which apparently is a three ply, much softer, and it doesn't harm the planet. Bamboo is like grass. It grows very, very fast. It is a grass. So every 24 hours, 27,000 trees every day are cut down just to make toilet paper. So support these. Right now we're using recycled, um, but uh, when we run out of our recycled toilet paper, we are going to go with bamboo. <clears throat> Loop is a company, and this guy, Tom Zaki, uh, has been convincing people to use recyclable containers. So they use recyclable containers for food, household, automotive products, and they give, give you these recyclable containers, like for peanut butter, for milk, for uh, shampoo. And then when you're finished with them, you put them back in this loop container and they pick it up. And then those, uh, the companies that are producing those products, Nestle's, et cetera, will clean them and reuse them. So this is a new initiative and I had not heard of it until recently. It's over time. Okay, we'll skip this page. And of course, as people shelter in place and streets remain empty, wildlife is returning to Inverness, Scotland. And we see here, there is Nessie coming back. Um, Apple is, is partnering with um, local communities to rebuild the mangroves, which are critical in terms of um, recycling. JetBlue is, um, this just came in the email today, by the way. <laughs> JetBlue is taking sustainability and they're trying to um, offset their domestic flights, et cetera, not just on Earth Day, but every day. Joe Biden, our president, has invited 40 world leaders. They are meeting today and tomorrow. Uh, it's live streamed. I have not unfortunately been watching it, but um, there is a link. I'm gonna look at a little bit of it. And he has been very pro uh, the, the climate change and saving the earth. And one of the things he's done is he brought in a Native American, um, Deb Haaland, as our US Interior Secretary. And she said, it's difficult not to feel obligated to protect this land. And I feel that every indigenous person in this country understands that. So she was confirmed as Biden's uh, Interior Secretary. And, oh, more comic strips. Um, man talking to his dog, you're being foolish. The earth doesn't talk, sure it does. It's a living, breathing organism, just like you and me. It grows and changes a little bit every day and speaks to all of us in one way or another. In fact, it's talking to you right now. To me, really? What's it saying? Nothing I can repeat in a comic strip. And, oh, and Ed says, I got to end soon. Um, we have here on Mars, we have definitive proofs there were ocean on Mars because of all the plastic that had been in the dried up oceans. And real estate used to be, if you could see uh, water, you had a high price. Now, if you can see land, you have a high price because the real, estate's price, real estate is dropping. Uh, Togo, this was 1971. Uh, we have met the enemy and it is us. It's hard walking on all this stuff. Yep, son. We have met the enemy and he is us. <clears throat> and Rachel Carson, of course, from 1962. Um, in nature, nothing exists alone. Chief Seattle, um, a uh, Native American, we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors. We borrow it from our children. Um, Neil deGrasse, is, you follow, follow his website. It's a great one to follow. Just to show you some of the as above, so below. Tree of life, 
And then you look at the human placenta and it looks very similar. A tree stump with its circles, a fingerprint, very similar. Along with its branches, a tree branch and a tree root with its branches. <clears throat> the veins in a leaf, veins in humans, veins in river networks. There's a lot of similarity. Not saying that uh, one copied the other, but there does seem to be some pattern. Joseph Campbell, the goal of your life is to make your heartbeat match the beat of the universe, to match your nature with nature. Compassion, we're all in this together. And this is my closing slide. We scientists don't know how to do that. This is Gus Smith. I used to think the top environmental problems were biodiversity loss, ecosystem collapse and climate change. I thought that with 30 years of good science, we could address those problems, but I was wrong. The top environmental problems are selfishness, greed, and apathy. And to deal with those, we need a spiritual and cultural transformation. And we scientists don't know how to do that. Thank you.